Hello, and welcome to A Health Podacy. We have this big problem, and a small minority of people are getting treatment, and it just seemed like such a policy failure that could be fixable. I'm your host, Alan Weil. In 2018, there were almost 1 million admissions to short-term residential facilities for substance use disorder treatment, commonly referred to as rehab. This expensive care setting accounts for more than a quarter of national spending on substance use treatment, and its use is growing rapidly. Now, there's actually limited evidence of the effectiveness of many substance use disorder treatment programs, but people in crisis due to substance use have few options, and there's an intuitive appeal associated with going to or sending someone to a safe residential setting away from the environment where substance use occurs. But this leads to concerns about aggressive recruitment into these programs, and that's the topic of our discussion today. For this episode of A Health Policy, I'm speaking with Tamara Beetham, a PhD student in health policy and management at Yale University. Beetham and co-authors published a paper in the February 2021 issue of Health Affairs that examines the admissions practices and costs of residential substance use disorder treatment programs. They used a sort of secret shopper approach, which uncovered some very interesting results, and I'm looking forward to discussing them. Uh, Ms. Beetham, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, let's jump into the topic today. I'm not sure everyone's familiar with these programs, so just give us a little background. What is rehab? Yeah, so um, residential treatment is a program where people go inpatient and they stay there. And within our study, we excluded places that sort of just do what's often called detoxification. And so these programs are generally about a month long where people go there and they get treatment sort of away from their home environment. And what kinds of treatment are people getting? In the programs that we studied, there were a range of treatments that were offered. Actually, Less than a third of the programs offered medication maintenance treatment, which is the gold standard of care. A similar proportion offered evidence-based non-medication treatment called cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT. Nine out of 10 of the programs offered some form of 12-step therapy. And um, there are also a few dozen other therapies that were offered that aren't necessarily clinically relevant or supported in the literature, but might sound perhaps enticing to a patient considering a program like art or animal therapy. So we've published on this topic before. There really is a gold standard of treatment and a surprisingly large share of these programs don't even offer it. Right. Now, let's talk about the diagnosis or the circumstances of the people who are coming into these programs. What what do we know about that? In our study, uh, we were focusing on opioid use disorder. So all the programs treat that population and also accept patients that don't have insurance uh, due to the nature of our study. And we also did ask them if there was anything that could make somebody not eligible to be admitted to the program. And the most often responses were patient substance use, psychiatric or medical conditions, suggesting that they may be trying to select patients that are less clinically complex and potentially a little bit less challenging to provide care for. And these programs are cheap, but tell us a little bit about what we know about their costs. Yeah, so we did find they were quite pricey. On average, it was $600 per day. And three quarters of of them as well uh, required upfront payments before the treatment could even begin. So they were on average five figure lump sums. And we also found that programs were encouraging debt based financing like credit cards, or we even came across sort of refinancing your house and sort of extreme scenarios like that. And these were occurring in one out of five of the for-profit programs. Let's just strip away some of the data here. These are folks who are in some sort of crisis. They know they need help. There aren't a lot of options available to them, and they're reaching out. How do people even find these programs? Do you know? Yeah. So we really tried to take a patient perspective um, in this project. And we used a government tool that patients can use to find treatment programs, um, like a treatment locator system. And we also used Google search engine sort of advertisements. 
So if a patient is to type into the Google search engine, you know, heroin rehab or something to that effect, then these programs would come up as advertisement. And so we did a combination of those within our study, which we think is reflective of what a patient would experience. Okay. So I have a really good picture now of who's coming into these programs. Let's now talk about your study. Sure. You basically audited the behavior of these programs. Tell me a little bit about how you did that. What is it that you were looking for? Like I had mentioned, we took sort of a patient perspective. We did something that's sometimes called a secret shopper study. And so we contacted programs as if we were um, a patient that's seeking treatment. And we asked sort of questions that a patient a prospective patient might want to know about a program before going there. And we used a script to keep it standardized across different programs and callers. Now, we're not going to go deep into methods here, but secret shopper is always, it sort of has an intuitive understanding of what it means. But standardization is really important here. You you don't want the, the person collecting the data to be sort of guiding the conversation in a certain way that could affect your findings. So just Tell me a little bit more about the script and the questions so that we we really have a sense of what it is that you are getting from these programs without in any way revealing to them that you were trying to figure out what they were up to. We did a lot of pilot calls and programs that are outside of the sample to develop the script. A lot of time um, and effort went into that and trying to make it sound like a natural conversation and sound the way a patient would normally sound. We had a patient profile. So, for example, we were a 26-year-old patient who lacks insurance, uses heroin daily. They don't have any other medical issues. We had both male and female callers. And we created a backstory that would be kind of consistent across all of our callers. And what were the practices you were looking for? I mean, if, if you have a hypothesis going in that there are some things going on here that might be of some concern, what are you worried about? Yeah, so we were primarily interested in asking questions about the cost of care, what therapies were offered, about their admissions practices. So for admissions practices, we were interested in whether there was quick access to treatment for eligible patients, what made a patient eligible, whether there was a formal clinical evaluation involved in the screening process. For recruitment practices, that was actually sort of an interesting development because that wasn't something we were intentionally trying to elicit, but it was such a prominent occurrence in the calls that we documented it. And those sort of fell into some categories like luxury-based recruitment, touting gourmet chefs, travel-based, like offering to book a flight for you, extending contact, like offering to text you or even contact your parents, which often sort of occurred in the context of how to finance the um, treatment program. You said recruitment isn't what you went in thinking you'd focus on. It was more cost and amenities or the like. Just help me understand that evolution. Yeah. So initially we were interested in sort of access to treatment, the cost, whether patients were able to get quick access to care, how affordable it would be. And then when developing the script during the pilot calls, sort of these recruitment techniques were really such a prominent part of them that it seemed important to include and document what was going on there. Well, I'm really eager to get deeper into the findings, but maybe before we do that, we'll take a quick break. 2021 is shaping up to be a big year in healthcare. Our battle with coronavirus continues. There are other coronaviruses waiting for us. In capitals from D.C. to Denver, new leaders and lawmakers are bringing their agendas to town. The states need to have the courage to stand up on behalf of their citizens. Tradeoffs is here to take you through the policies and programs and will introduce you to the people whose lives they shape. I'm Dan Gorenstein, and this is Tradeoffs, available wherever you get your podcasts. And we're back with Tamara Beetham talking about recruitment into residential substance use treatment programs. Before the break, you were describing some of the aspects of these programs that you found. Let's dive a little deeper into the study findings. So I think what stood out to me as I read the paper is some of the things that these folks were saying are clearly designed to make their programs appealing, which I guess isn't a bad thing. They lead to the question of, are the right people coming in? Is this the right program? Are people making decisions on the basis of the criteria that 
objectively would we would say they should be using to determine whether or not this is a good fit for them. So tell us a little bit about that potential mismatch or what concerns you started to see as you were listening to these uh, interviews. The admissions and recruitment practices we saw ranged from potentially helpful to likely harmful. So we saw rapid access to treatment in general, which is good. It suggests that there's capacity existing, which is relevant for sort of the call of expansion of beds from policymakers. However, callers were also often admitted by non-clinical personnel without any formal evaluation determining whether residential treatment is even clinically necessary uh, relative to other types of treatment that might be a better clinical fit, lifestyle fit, financial fit. And if a patient's a good clinical fit for a program offering um, evidence-based treatment, then um, some recruitment techniques might actually help mitigate access barriers, but it is sort of a fine line where they could also be problematic if they're pressuring families and patients into a treatment program that's not actually clinically necessary, it hasn't been evaluated as to whether it's clinically necessary, uh, they're not offering evidence-based treatment, or they're pressuring the patient and their family into a sort of precarious financial situation. So these are phone, this is someone who reaches out by phone. So right. you would expect there to be some pause in the process before they're actually taking your credit card to assess the person clinically. And in some instances, you're saying that didn't happen. Right. And this was especially prominent with for-profit facilities. Yeah, so, so let's focus of... on that. So uh, give us a sense of the difference between these two. How how many there are that are for-profit, non-profit? Are they parts of big chains? Uh, do they cost more? Just tell us a little bit more about that distinction, because it certainly shines through in the data. Sure. So we contacted over 600 facilities throughout the country and about half were for-profit and half were non-profit. And they differed in several ways. So in terms of cost, the for-profits were twice as much per day as the non-profits. Nine out of 10 of them required upfront payments compared to half of the non-profits. And those lump sum upfront payments were three times as much as the nonprofits for admissions, which I think you were alluding to earlier, the for-profits were more likely to sort of screen out patients that are more medically complex, which is concerning if they're sort of cherry picking healthier patients, because those are probably the patients that are least likely to need sort of the intensity of residential treatment. Um, and they may actually benefit most from outpatient medication maintenance treatment. I want to pause here because this seems like a really important issue. I mean, on the one hand, we've got concerns about recruitment and aggressiveness. But what what I'm hearing you say is that the the recruitment process could actually lead to a poor clinical fit that by basically seeking out people with lower needs because they're easier to treat, you're actually over treating some people. And yet we have this tremendous shortage of providers in substance use treatment. And so you're sort of using up this high level capacity with people who don't need it, which presumably makes it harder in the long run uh, for, for those with greater need to, to find, a, find a place to go. Right, exactly. And that sort of highlights a difference with the nonprofits as well, because the nonprofits were less discriminatory in who they accepted, but they had sort of higher barriers to entry in terms of being less likely to be able to offer quick access, less likely to be able to offer vouchers and grants for help with payment. So those are sort of where the patients that actually need treatment are needing to go to, but they aren't able to sort of get there as quickly. And so then that's sort of funneling people into the for-profit market that, you know, may need treatment less and they're paying a much higher price tag. So another variable uh, that someone looking for care might consider is accreditation. You think, okay, well, uh, you know, I'm only going to go to a place that has a little seal of approval. I may not know the organization that's giving that seal, but at least it gives me some comfort that this program is following some standards. What did you find about that? Right. That was a little bit disappointing because you'd think that that would be a really good tool, um, accreditation, to sort of reduce these um, inappropriate business practices, unnecessary barriers, but it just 
didn't turn out that way. In terms of our findings, we saw that accredited programs were actually more likely to offer admission to patients before a full clinical evaluation. They were more likely to actively recruit patients with inducements. And it's unfortunate these accreditations are coming from private companies that advertise high quality, but they don't actually have those quality standards publicly available. So we couldn't even see if it was consistent with our findings. So it seems like in this instance, at least in part, I don't want to say this is everything, but at least in part, the accreditation is basically another marketing tool that you get this seal that you can put on. People can't really figure out what it's what it means, but it, it actually makes it easier to do the recruitment practices that probably are not so good for patients. Exactly. And there's not really much out there for transparency of quality. So if a patient is looking for a program, then they might see that sort of seal of approval, so to speak, on a website and think that it's credible. They're going to offer them, you know, high quality standard of care, but that doesn't actually seem to indicate much, which is confusing for patients. I hear this and I read the paper and it makes me pretty concerned. Uh, Mm -hmm. I gather from your uh, voice that, that you share some of those concerns. So as you think forward, you're at the beginning of your research uh, career. Mm -hmm. What are some other questions that this work leads you to that you think would be good topics for additional study? So I'm generally interested in improving access to evidence-based treatment for patients with opioid use disorder and how policies sort of affect that access. And that's kind of been the thread that flows through all my work this far. I think in light of this paper, an important next step is thinking about trying to assess the effectiveness of residential treatment and how that compares to no treatment, how it compares to outpatient medication maintenance treatment, other options we have available to us. And I think that's really important for trying to help guide policymakers with more specificity on maybe how they can direct their funding and what sort of policies that they should be making to kind of regulate this market. I probably should have asked this earlier, but you mentioned that in the script, you talked about someone who was a daily user of heroin and we're in the midst of an Mm -hmm. opioid epidemic. And I think a lot of people associate that epidemic with pills and not heroin. I just wonder if you could say a little more about that, both the reason you use that and how that affects your thinking about future topics of study. Yes, we chose a patient profile of a person that uses heroin because we wanted to sort of represent a profile of a typical person with opioid use disorder. And at this point, that really is what a typical person with opioid use disorder is using. Several years ago, it really started with pills. And that was what was accounting for a lot of the opioid mortalities. But the epidemic has sort of evolved since then, such that heroin then became the main driver of opioid mortalities. And now it's really sort of fentanyl that's being mixed in with the heroin. Um, that's uh, causing a lot of the mortality. So we sort of selected this profile as somebody that we thought would be sort of an unremarkable patient, something that's sort of typical of somebody who might call these programs. And you mentioned your research interests are about access to evidence-based care. You know, at the early stages of a career, you've got to pick a topic. I just wonder if you could say a little more about why you chose this direction. I am from an area that's rather rural in Connecticut, and I had previously been doing research in mental health and psychiatry, but then as the epidemic sort of started coming to light for me, at least, I was seeing a lot of classmates that I went to school with that were passing away, and it was such a frequent occurrence and so surprising as such a young person to have so many people you know passing away so frequently. And so sort of like, what is going on here? And I was in my master's program um, at the time and started sort of writing about that. And I got really interested in the idea that we actually have effective medication for people. We have this big problem and a small minority of people are getting treatment, something like one in five around there in a given year. And then a small minority of those, only a third of people are getting evidence-based treatment. And it just seemed like such a policy failure that could be fixable. And so I really wanted to try to work to improve the policy to create better access for patients. Well, I have to say, I'm sorry that's your motivation, but I Mm -hmm. hope you take some comfort in the notion that your 
course of study has really opened up uh, my eyes, and I'm sure will open many others to a problem here, which uh, which you've described in great detail in our conversation. And I feel confident, given what this paper has to offer, that as you continue your work, you'll uncover more important information that will yield better policy and better practice and hopefully exactly what you set out to accomplish, which is to get better uh, evidence-based treatment to people who need it, because certainly the practices you describe here make one concerned about that not happening. Thank you. And thank you for having me. It's been uh, great learning from you and discussing your work, Ms. Beatham. It's great having you today on A Health Policy. Thank you. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed today's episode, I hope you'll tell a friend about A Health Policy. Health Policy is produced by Health Affairs, the leading journal for health policy research. The team behind the show includes Patty Sweet, Jeff Byers, Brian Dobbs, Julia Vivolo, Sarah Kolk, and Sue Ducat. Like the show? Subscribe to A Health Policy on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Thanks for listening, and have a great morning, day, or evening.